Hello and welcome to the final lecture video of SAM 2. This is Venus Flytrap and Plant Hormones. Essentially, I took everything plant related from chapter 14 and chapter 15 and sort of combined it into this one lecture. Now, chapter 14 is homeostasis and chapter 15 is control and coordination. And it's all about how cells talk to each other and how the body responds to stimuli. And this occurs in plants as well. In this particular chapter, we're going to do electrical communication, which is found in a Venus flytrap, and chemical communication, which has to do with these three different hormones, auxin, gibberellin, and abscisic acid. They all have different roles, and they all have different mechanisms. Now, I know you hate plants, but honestly, plants are easy to score. In past years, these, are, these questions are always very straightforward, so you should pay attention to this particular um, lecture video and not ignore it, okay? Like the rest of your plant chapters. Don't ignore it. It's easy. I'm just saying. Anyway, let's start with electrical communication in plants. Now, we know electrical communication in mammals is through neurons, but in plants, it is not, and it only occurs in certain plant species. We have some similarities, though. They both have electrochemical gradients, okay? Plant cells also have sodium-potassium pumps to do stuff. They have resting potential, and it has action potentials. But um, in mammals... Depolarization is due to sodium ions, whereas plants is mostly used to chloride ions moving out. Action potential travels along neurons in mammals, but in plants, there are no neurons. Okay, there are no neurons in plants. It's usually via cell membrane and cell-to-cell -cell, uh, signaling via plasmodesmata. The speed of transmission of um, these action potentials in mammals is definitely faster and plants is much slower. Why do plants need some of these electrical communication? Well, some of these plants need to respond to certain stimuli or have evolved to respond to certain stimuli, like the Venus flytrap. And like usual, we have to do the structure first, then we'll do the process. So this is a Venus flytrap plant, very pretty diagram. Let's look at the anatomy. It has um, a nectar glands to attract insects, on its leaf, this is actually a modified leaf, its leaf has stiff outer edges which interlock, so they overlap a little bit to trap the insect inside, inside. There is the lobe. The lobe is actually, again, a modified leaf, a specialized leaf. And on that leaf, there are sensory hairs, three on each side, so six in total. And the deflection of this sensory hair, so if you bend it, it can stimulate action potential and cause the leaf to fold. In the leaf, there are also digestive glands which secrete digestive enzymes on the lobe surface in order to digest the insect. And um, as I said, this is a modified leaf. So these two are the lobes or the lamina, and it does have a midrib. But the midrib is what we call a hinge, like a door hinge. So here's a video so that you can get a more realistic picture of how it goes. This video is not mine, it is from BBC and it's narrated by this one and only Sir David Attenborough. So let's watch this. This is a highly sophisticated trap. The bait? Sugary nectar around the rim of the disc. The triggers? Fine hairs two of which have to be touched within 20 seconds of each other. The victim, a fly, which finds the color and nectar irresistible. One.
When triggered, the trap snaps shut so fast that the fly is imprisoned. The Venus flytrap now slowly digests its victim. I don't know about you, but no matter how many times I watch this video, it's still amazing. So, how does it work? The video is fascinating, but how does it work? What mechanisms are in place in order for what we saw just now, mechanical energy by the fly to be converted into electrical energy? So the fly goes there, touches the sensory health, bends it mechanically, but then that is transformed into electrical energy that causes the Venus flytrap to close. So what actually happens? Let's see. Number one, sensory hair cell is a receptor and detects touch. Okay, again, there are six sensory hair cells um, present there. And each lobe has three sensory hairs. If two hairs are touched or one hair is touched twice within around 35 seconds, then, let's say this two, the calcium ion channels open at the cells at the base of the, the hair. Calcium ions then flow in and the cell membrane is depolarized. And when it depolarizes, an action potential occurs. Now this depolarization happens at the base of the hair first, but then later on spreads over the leaf or the lobe to the midrib or the hinge cells. So imagine the calcium ions here, depolarization happens at the base of the hair, and then it moves, the depolarization moves to the hinge cells. This is what happens at the hinge cells. This is what we call acid growth. This is something we will learn and repeat a few times in this lecture, acid growth, remember that. Now, acid growth happens at the hinge cells, which is here. H+, plus, okay, the action potential reaches the hinge cells, and then H+, plus is pumped out of cells into cell walls. Now, hydrogen ions um, lower the pH, isn't it? Therefore, cross links in the cell wall are broken. Okay, Calcium pectate, which is some kind of glue in the cell wall, of... Uh, specifically the middle lamella of the cell wall dissolves and therefore the cell wall loosens up a little bit. In addition to that, calcium ions enter the hinge cell. So this is pumped out. Calcium ions enter hinge cells and water enters hinge cells by osmosis because, well, there is more concentrate. There's a higher concentration inside now. So water enters, and you expect the cell to expand. And since the cell wall is loosened, this means the cells can expand more. It's not, the cell is no longer restricted by the cell wall. And therefore, okay, this causes the lobes to change shape from convex. So the tension is held here. When the cell expands, that closes. It makes the lobes change to concave shapes and the trap shuts quickly in like 0.3 seconds. As we saw in the video just now, it was real time, by the way. It's really quick. We say that the elastic tension, okay, at the convex, and there's actually elastic tension, is actually released when the lobes shut. Wonderful. So, it has shut now. What's going to go, what's going to happen? Now, S the insect struggles, there will be further deflections of sensory hair. And the more it struggles, the more action potentials will be triggered, and this will cause the trap to seal. Again, it will stimulate entry of calcium ions into gland cells, and this is the gland cells of the digestive um, glands. This stimulates the exocytosis of vesicles containing digestive enzymes and therefore those digestive enzymes are secreted to do what? To digest the insect. Lah. 
The trap stays shut for up to one week. One week. For digestion. Again, see, it's very slow in the plant. Okay, it's very fast in you, but it's very slow in the plant. And after digestion, only after digestion, the cells on the upper surface of the midrib grow slowly and the relief reopens and the elastic tension builds in the cell walls of the midrib again and it becomes convex again in shape until the next insect comes and then there's deflection and extra potential again become concave again and close again okay so <clears throat> the question is are there adaptations to conserve energy and avoid closing unnecessary because if you think about it what if it rains and it touches a few few um sensory hair cells sensory hairs would that cause the venous flytrap to close um if so wouldn't that be a waste of energy? So, what are the adaptations here? Number one, stimulation of a single hair does not trigger closure. So, it has to stimulate two hairs and between, within 35 seconds. It cannot be too long, too far apart. This prevents the trap from closing when raining, as I said just now, or when little dust or debris fall into the trap. Very unlikely that it will touch two hairs within 35 seconds of the same leaf. It's a very tiny plant, okay? It's not very big. It's very tiny plant. It's like this tiny. Now, the second thing is, gaps between stiff hairs allow very small insects to crawl out. So if the insect is too small, and even the trap closes, it still can crawl out, and the Venus flytrap doesn't need to spend the energy trying to digest a very, very small insect. It only captures the large ones that cannot crawl out. And that's it for Venus flytrap, essentially. Let's move on to chemical communication. Chemical communication in plants is via plant hormones or plant growth regulators. They're produced in a variety of plant tissues. Plant tissues, by the way, do not have endocrine glands. So these are just normal plant cells around. Okay, it can be produced by them. And uh, these plant hormones also interact with receptors inside or outside the cell, depending on the hormone, and initiate a signaling cascade, just like mammalian hormones. So... It's not produced endocrine glands, but it functions, it signals like a mammalian hormone. Movement of plant hormones can be via two ways. Number one is directly cell to cell. It could be via active transport or it could be via diffusion. Okay, this is from cell to cell. Or number two, it can be via phloem or xylem vessels. There are three different uh, um, hormones that we're going to learn here. Oxins, gibberellins, and abscisic acid. Let me give you an overview of these three hormones first. Okay, just a simple overview. Number one is auxins. We abbreviate this as IAA. It stimulates growth by cell elongation at tips of roots and shoots. So cell elongation is the cell becoming longer la, and it's only at the tips of roots and shoots. So only at the tips. It also inhibits lateral growth or branching. Okay, it means it doesn't allow the plant to grow sideways or branch out, but instead it will grow upwards or downwards, like straight. Now this is called apical dominance. Apical means tip. So this is at tips. Dominance means bigger, right? So the tips grow bigger, essentially. Inhibiting label lateral growth is apical dominance, by the way. Now, how does it do this? This is by something called acid growth hypothesis. And we learn about acid growth just a little bit when we talked about Venus flytrap just now, didn't we? Now, we're going to do it in more detail in a while. The second hormone we're going to learn here is gibberellins. Gibberellins is abbreviated by the GA. It's involved on two things. One is seed germination, and number two is stem elongation. So both things. It causes breakdown of DELA proteins. Okay, DELA proteins are actually inhibitors of cell growth and seed germination. So by breaking down these inhibitors, you actually promote growth. You promote seed germination and stem elongation. And the third hormone. The third hormone is abscisic acid. Now, this hormone is actually from the chapter homeostasis, and it's actually a hormone that helps the plant respond to water stress. So when water is not available, or available in very, very small amounts, abscisic acid can stimulate closure of stomata. 
helping the plant conserve water. And with this, there is also a mechanism. But what you need to know, the most important thing you need to know, is that it uses calcium ion as a second messenger during cell signaling. So let's start with auxins. Auxins are actually a group of several chemicals. The main auxin is IAA, which is indole acetic acid. This is why auxins is abbreviated as IAA. Now, it's synthesized, as we said just now, in the growing tips of shoots and roots only, aka at the apical meristems. Apical again means tip, okay, like an apex, apical. Meristems are actually at the tips where um, the cells are like stem cells and there are active mitosis. The role of auxin in this is really to number one, stimulate cell elongation, as we mentioned just now, and number two, inhibit lateral growth or branching, i.e. apical dominance. This causes plants to grow taller towards the light instead of sideways. P.S. Before we move on, you have to understand that in plants, the hormones actually work together. So auxin is not solely responsible for apical dominance. Dominance is just one of the many, many um, plant growth regulators that work together, that interact in order to enhance apical dominance and stimulate cell elongation. For example, later on we will learn that gibberellin or GA enhances IAA. Okay, now let's talk about how auxin works. Auxin, again, is a plant hormone and it uses the acid growth hypothesis. This is an even um, detailed version compared to just now. Okay, so number one, auxin, the plant hormone, binds to the receptors in the cell surface membrane and this stimulates the proton pumps in the cell membrane um, and this causes H plus, H ions, to be transported from cytoplasm into cell wall by active transport. So this requires ATP. As a result, the pH becomes lower in the cell wall, or in other words, the cell wall becomes more acidic. Now what happens when the cell wall becomes more acidic? It's just the cell wall, right? No, no, no. pH-dependent enzymes are activated. They are activated at low pH to weaken the cell wall. What they do is they break hydrogen bonds between cellulose microfibrils. The cell wall, as a result, loosens and becomes more elastic and can stretch. Ions enter cell and the water potential of cell decreases as a result and the water can enter cell by osmosis. This results in increased integral pressure and because now the cell wall is loosened and it's more elastic, right? Then the cell wall can expand a little bit, causing the elongation of cell. Ta-da! So before it's like this, after it's like this. Now, the hypothesis is supported because of few experiments. So this is less important, but I'll just say it anyway. Cell elongation can be prevented by neutralizing the acidity of the cell wall using a buffer. Means, if you make it less acidic in the cell wall, like by putting maybe a little bit of NaOH, this will stop cell elongation. The reverse is true. If you manually, experimentally introduce an acid into the cell wall, you can also cause cell elongation. And number three, um, scientists have tested and realized that protons are indeed released from cells in response to auxin. So we know that auxin would be able, uh, is stimulating cell elongation by the acid growth hypothesis. Now, what's interesting, what's the application of this? Now, again, auxin is stimulating cell elongation in the tips of roots and shoots. If there's uneven distribution of auxin, this can cause stem or root to bend in response to stimuli. So for example, if the sun is here and the shoot is here, the auxin will be evenly distributed and it will move upwards. Yeah, it will grow upwards. Whereas if the sun is at the side here, you realize that the auxin molecules will tend to um, be more concentrated on the left side than on the right. 
and this causes the cells on the left side to grow more and bend towards the sun. How cool is that? So the higher the concentration of auxin, the more the cell elongation. So if there's more concentration again on the left side, those cells will grow, causing the entire shoot to bend. Okay, some more. Auxin inhibits lateral growth at growing tips of shoots. So this is what happens when you are pruning a plant. Why are you pruning? Okay, what's pruning? Pruning means like cutting off the 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 stems a little bit. So um if you prune like the newly growing shoots, this actually promotes lateral growth. Okay, if you cut off the shoot, this means it will stop growing taller and will grow sideways. So you get a bushier plant. Well, my dad does this and it actually works. So maybe you can try. <laughs> and that's it for auxin. Moving on to gibberellins. Gibberellins or GA is a plant growth regulator or plant hormone. Now, it is synthesized in young leaf seeds and stems. Auxins just now are synthesized in the tips of shoots and roots. These are these gibberellins are synthesized in younger plants, so young leaves, young stems, and seeds. Its roles makes um, is consistent with that, right? Number one is in charge of seed germination, and number two is stimulates cell division and cell elongation in the stem. If young leaves and stems, right, young plants, it. There is interaction between gibberellin and other plant growth regulators. For example, we already know about one, gibberellin, sorry, gibberellin does enhance IAA. Now, before we go into um, the role of gibberellin in seed germination first, we're going to do cell division later, but seed germination first, we need to know the structure of the seeds. So the example we're using here is wheat or barley. A wheat and barley, it has this similar structure. But if it helps you, you can think of rice. So um, the white polished rice that we've seen is really just the middle part here. Um, and in its natural growing environment, there's actually a husk over it. So think about that when we are studying here. Okay, So let's work from um, outside in. The husk right, is actually called pericarp and testa. This is a tough protective layer now inside a uh, coating that middle part is called the alluron which is a protein rich layer inside somewhere is endosperm which is storage of starch this is what provides the nutrients for um for growth and then there is the scutulum scutulum is the seed leaf so this layer will eventually become the first leaf of the seed whereas the last one is the most important thing it is the embryo which develops into the new plant so all these structures have different um different functions right the embryo here is like the baby and the rest is just protecting it or providing them the nutrients. So how is it that gibberellin promotes seed germination? Let's look at this process now. Now, remember seeds are dormant. It can be dormant, especially if there's no water, there is no sunshine. Yeah. And it can remain dormant for a very long period of time. You can freeze it and keep it and plant, defrost it and plant it, and it'll be fine. And even naturally, there are proteins, which we talked about a little bit just now, they act as inhibitors of cell growth and seed germination inside the seed. So naturally, it is dormant and maintains seed dormancy. But when there is water around, when there is uh, conditions that are suitable, the seed can absorb water by osmosis, and this water is actually the one that stimulates production of gibberellin by the embryo. So the embryo here, number one, osmosis. Number two, gibberellin is produced by the embryo. Gibberellin then diffuses from the embryo into the cells of the alluron layer. Now the alluron layer, just a reminder, is between the testa pericarp and 
the endosperm. Yeah, is this layer outside? Um, if it helps, the aileron layer is the is like on brown rice. It has this like brown layer. That's actually the aileron layer that has a lot of protein. Now that gibberellin actually causes the breakdown of the la proteins, which is an inhibitor, and switches on the genes coding for hydrolytic enzymes in the um, aileron layer. The storage protein breaks down into amino acids. So aileron, the protein-rich layer, is broken down into amino acids, and these amino acids is used to synthesize amylase. So the genes coding for hydrolytic enzymes is switched on, and there's also amino acids to make those enzymes, and one of the enzymes is amylase. Which leads us to our fourth point. This amylase from the aileron layer, so on the outside, diffuses into the endosperm, which is the, the starch, the area containing starch, and it hydrolyzes that starch into maltose, and that maltose is then converted to glucose. So now you have a lot of glucose. So glucose can diffuse from the endosperm into the embryo plant and provide a source of energy for growth of the embryo plant. So the embryo plant can have respiration okay, and um, use that energy in order to grow. So that's how gibberellin results in seed germination. But how about stem elongation? How about cell division? So as we know, gibberellin is a plant growth regulator. It stimulates cell division and cell elongation stem and causes the plant to grow tall. And we know that because when we apply gibberellin to dwarf plants, they just grow taller. So it's pretty cool. Um, but actually, after further research, you realize that dwarf plants actually have an inactive form of gibberellin. They have gibberellin, but it's inactive. So let's see the difference between active gibberellin and inactive gibberellin. Now, the gibberellin is a hormone again, and its presence is determined by alleles. Alleles are a form of gene, okay? So different alleles will result in different gibberellin. Inactive or active. So there's a dominant allele, which is big LE. Um, you realize it's in italics purpose. This codes for a functional enzyme needed in the gibberellin synthesis pathway. So if the plant has this dominant allele, it the enzyme will be converted from inactive to active gibberellin. It only needs one dominant allele to grow to normal height. So it can be dominant and dominant, so homozygous dominant. I know you've learned this in IGs. Or it can be dominant and one recessive allele, so heterozygous. And it can grow to normal height because, again, the gibberellin is active. But if you have two copies of the recessive alleles, this codes for a non-functional enzyme. Plants with two copies of the recessive allele cannot synthesize gibberellin, and this results in dwarf varieties. Dwarf plants, again, have an inactive form of gibberellin because they have, two homo they have two recessive alleles. They are homozygous recessive. Okay, so let's say you have active gibberellin. How does it work? Let's talk about the case without gibberellin first. So without GA, this is what happens. The transcription factor, so something that helps with transcription, for example, is called PIF here. PIF, which is a transcription factor that helps in transcription, is attached to DELA protein. And therefore, PIF, which is supposed to bind to DNA, cannot bind to DNA for transcription. But when gibberellin binds to a receptor, on the cell surface, this causes DELA to be destroyed. So if DELA is destroyed, this means PIF is freed up. The inhibition of transcription is removed as PIF, the transcription factor, can bind to DNA and promote transcription by recruiting RNA polymerase to bind with DNA. 
as a result, this gene for, um, for growth is switched on. This is not just one gene, this is a lot of different genes related to growth. The plant will ding, 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 go um, taller. Ta -da. Now you realize that this is stem elongation only. So we're not talking about leaf growing a lot of leaves or we're not talking about roots we're just talking about stem you can see this flower the middle part here grows longer due to stem elongation so that when the growth genes are switched on um it causes cell division okay, that's the first thing you should know and it's in the stem as we said just now not anywhere else it also causes cell elongation in stem by interacting with auxin and auxin can actually use the acid growth hypothesis in order to loosen the cell wall and cause cell elongation okay this all things all these things are the same as the previous few slides when we talked about auxin so gibberellin does enhance auxin see and when growth genes are switched on this also increases internode length what is internode length internode is the um distance between one branch with the leaf and the other so internode here you can see the internode length increases, uh, which is quite obvious when you see this little diagram here, as the stem elongates. So that's it for gibberellin. Okay, now we have only one plant hormone left. One more plant hormone called abscisic acid. But before we go there, we need to learn how stomata work. So these are guard cells. They make up the stomata. Each stomatal pore is surrounded by two guard cells. Guard cells are sausage-shaped sausage cells. It's very hard to say, okay? With chloroplasts, they are highly specialized cells. So how are they specialized? Here it is. It's very interesting, okay? Number one, they have unevenly thickened cell walls. The middle, the inner wall, is more thick and they are less elastic. Okay, the wall furthest from the wall, the outer wall, is thinner and is more elastic. So when turgid, <clears throat> you expect the thinner walls to bend more than the thicker walls. Okay, so you can see here, this th thinner wall seems to curve more. This one curves less and this actually opens the pore. Number two. Bundles of cellulose microfibrils are arranged as hoops around the guard cells. So cool, right? Why? Because when it's turgid, this allows it to increase in length and not diameter. So it can increase in length and therefore bend instead of becoming just fatter cells. Okay, so cells will bend and curve when length is increased. Now, how the stomata usually open? Stomata is um, the singular. Stoma is plural. Okay, I think. Or was it the other way around? Anyways, number one, proton pumps in the cell surface membrane of guard cells actually pumps the hydrogen ions out of the guard cells, resulting in low concentration of hydrogen ions in the guard cells. And therefore, inside of the cell is more negative than the outside, and electrochemical gradient is formed. Now, this electrochemical gradient, this decrease, um, I'm sorry, this increase in negativity inside the cell causes the potassium channels to open. So, potassium ion enters via facilitated diffusion, okay, because inside more negative, right? And, and uh, potassium ion is a positive ion, so it enters. And, and because it's positive, it attracts chloride ions, which also diffuse in, causing the water potential of cells to decrease. And therefore, water moves in by osmosis via aquaporins. Aquaporins are channel proteins for water. And since water moves in, the volume of guard cells increase. Okay, so it increases in length and become turgid and curved due to the unequal thickness in cell wall and therefore the pore opens. So there are all these ions moving in and out, causing this. Stomata opens in response to, so that mechanism happens when there is an increase in light intensity. This one we already know. 
low carbon dioxide concentration in air spaces of leaf because carbon dioxide is needed for photosynthesis and oxygen is produced in response. So if there's low CO2 inside, it will open to get CO2 and allow O2 to get out. Also, this allows transpiration to occur as a side effect. And this brings water and mineral ions into the plants. Also for photosynthesis. Photosynthesis requires water and CO2, right? What is it close in response to? Decrease in light intensity. So all the things we saw just now in reverse, yeah? Decrease in light intensity, high CO2 in air spaces of leaf, or CO2 is not required because there's no photosynthesis going on. Okay, so you already have enough CO2 or it's not required anyway because maybe there's no sunlight. Or there is low humidity, high temperature, and high wind speed or some sort of water stress. The stomata would close to maintain cell turgidity and prevent water loss by transpiration and make sure the plant has enough water to survive. So what helps stomata close? Abscisic acid. Abscisic acid is a water stress hormone. It's produced during water stress, aka when you know there's a very high temperature, there's a reduced water supply. Okay, any water stress. In when this happens, it's synthesized in all cells with chloroplasts or aminoplasts. Aminoplast is very similar to chloroplast, but no chlorophyll, lah. Okay. And what it does is it stimulates stomata closure. It reduces, it stimulates stomata closure and therefore reduces water vapor loss from leaves and also reduce rate of CO2 uptake for photosynthesis. This is a fast response. It does not regulate expression of genes. It's, it, expression of genes takes some time because you need to transcribe, right? This is not like that. This just fools around with some channel. So let's go. Let's see how. ABA is secreted and bind to ABA receptors on the cell surface membrane of the gut cells. That's number one. Okay, look at here. What happens is those uh, receptors stimulate calcium ion influx from outside the cell or inside the vacuole. You know how the vacuole stores ions? Now that calcium ions is going to come out through those channels. Calcium ions act as a secondary messenger. This sort of like a signaling pathway and triggers a cascade of reactions. What does it do? Now, calcium ions, as we see in this diagram, in yellow cute star here, it inhibits proton pumps. So remember in stomata opening, proton is pumped, proton, uh, proton is pumped out. Now it's inhibited and therefore hydrogen ions cannot move out and there's a higher concentration of hydrogen ions inside the cell. It also inhibits potassium influx. So potassium channels are closed. It also promotes potassium efflux, which means it promotes the potassium ions to go out. So it potassium move out. This activates channel proteins also to allow negatively charged ions to leave the gut cell. So the chloride ions that was inside will now leave. As a result, more ions leave. And therefore, inside, there is a lot of water. This increases water potential, and therefore, water leaves by osmosis, and gut cells become flaccid, and therefore, the stomata closes. And ta -da, that's what ABA does. It's just a list of things to remember, honestly. And again, the response is very fast. It doesn't require transcriber genes. It just switches, it just closes channels, open channels, uses calcium ions as a second messenger. So with that, we're done. We've done Venus flytrap. We've done oxygen, dribbling, and abscisic acid. You need to know the process for everything. But as I said again, plants, Historically, in past years, very easy to score, very straightforward, questions as well as answers. So yeah, that's it for this semester. See you next time. Bye!